the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Interesting show tonight. We are going deep into Nashville's past to look at one of Nashville's most notorious murders. A recent book is out, and it examines this murder and questions whether well, it basically says the wrong person was convicted for this crime. The murder back in 1964 of a babysitter, an 18-year-old uh, woman who was babysitting her young brother. I've done a story on this book. I find it fascinating, and I'm glad that tonight we have with us the author, Michael Bishop. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ben. Um, you spent a long time working on this. Years. Many, many years. Many years. Many years. And I, I, I encourage you, you know, to, to call in if you remember this particularly. 1964. This was a huge deal, right? It was. It was the first year, basically the first year of Metro Nashville being formed. So it was Metro Nashville was formed when the city and county merged on uh, the stroke of midnight, April Fool's Day, 1963. This was the first big murder case, the Paula Herring murder. So we're talking about the Paula Herring murder, and as we as we talk about this. I want to just play the story that we did, and then Please. we'll come back and talk about it. So this is a story that aired in late October, and it kind of just goes over the book that Michael Bishop spent a couple decades writing. But let's take a look at that story, then come back and talk about it. It's a lonely looking building, home to dusty records, deeds, and files dating back decades. I have no idea where I was going or what I was going to be looking for. Michael Bishop is an amateur researcher who first came to the Metro Archives in 1997. That's when one file caught his eye. I just happened to be here on the day, the right day, the right time, and stumbled upon the file. The police department had just transferred stacks of documents from its first police chief, Hubert Kemp. Hidden among them was this file of the 1964 murder of 18-year-old Paula Herring. Discovering the file is what clued me into there's some problems here. But it was one surprising document in that file that really caught his attention. The letter from Mayor Briley explaining his presence in the neighborhood on the night of the murder. Bishop believes the evidence, including that letter, points to a political cover-up that sent an innocent man to prison. He spent the next 20 years tracking down witnesses, digging into what really happened. There's a lot of people who now are willing to talk and who were willing to tell their involvement. Uh, they were willing to fess up and say, yep, we lied, we had to. The old Nashville of the 1950s and 60s was very different from today. Nashville was one of the most corrupt cities in America. Uh, Printer's Alley, any kind of vice you wanted, you could get it there. On the same day the Beatles ended their famous U.S. tour, Paula Herring's murder dominated Nashville's newspapers. She was brutally beaten and shot in her Creve Hall home while babysitting her young brother. Things like this didn't happen in 1964, so we were all devastated. K Knox played on Paula's high school basketball team. It was just horrifying that somebody that you know is brutally murdered like that in her own home. Police quickly arrested John Randolph Clark. The theory was he wanted to rape Paula, but she was not sexually assaulted, and despite evidence of a brutal fight, he had no cuts or scratches. The real motive in this case um, turns out to be what Paula Herring knew about some of the activities of these very powerful people. Bishop says Paula's mother, a Vanderbilt nurse, was part of a well-connected drinking club that included Mayor Beverly Briley. Briley skillfully led Nashville as Metro's first mayor, but Bishop says his personal life often included heavy drinking with police detectives, prosecutors, and at least three nurses. One of those club members ends up being the very first suspect in the Paula Herring murder. This previously unpublished picture shows the woman who first found Paula's body. Bishop says she also happened to be the mayor's mistress. She was interviewed by detectives but Bishop says she was let go after the mayor gave her an alibi. That photograph actually pointed me to the identity of the mayor's mistress, and it was from there that I was actually able to figure out what had taken place. Bishop found it odd Mayor Briley sent this letter to the police chief. It put the mayor in Creve Hall at the time of the murder. 
On the night that Miss Herring was murdered, I was leaving a house in Creve Hall when I heard the report to the police department over the shortwave radio in my car. Bishop says there's no indication Briley was at Paula's home, just that he wanted to protect his mistress. The rest of these people could not have this woman you know, being tried or being uh, arrested or anything. Although Bishop asked us not to give away the ending of his book, he says he obtained a confession from someone who was there that night. Was justice served? Hardly. Injustice served? Absolutely. The book is now getting national attention. I think it's justice for Paula. I think it's finally what sets her situation free. Over the last 20 years, the people Bishop believes were involved in the murder have passed away. John Randolph Clark was paroled after just nine years. He died maintaining his innocence. Ben Hall, News Channel 5, investigates. So there's a lot to, to go over here. Um, political cover-up. Yes. You were drawn to this. You say in there, was justice served? No, justice was not served. I guess go over again. How, how were you drawn to this case? So initially I was drawn to this. A friend had asked me to do some research on the top 40 stories from Nashville history. Um, the stories turned out to be a little on the morbid side, I guess I would say. Uh, they ranged from the 1918, uh, the railroad accident, the worst railroad accident in United States history. Still, that's still the case when two trains collided uh, out in Belmead. There's a historical marker on that. There yes. absolutely yes, is. There. Uh, over 100 people killed. Uh, almost 200 were injured. So stories like that, the Jim Reeves country music star plane crash uh, out in Brentwood, um, the Marsha Trimble case. So the idea was to just try to, to come up with some idea of what the top 40 stories might be. So I ended up going to the Metro Archives over on Elm Hill Pike. Uh, that location still exists, though not, it uh, doesn't have a day-to-day, -day, um, I guess, traffic or work that they do there at this point. So I literally walked in, uh, spoke with him about helping me identify what those 40 stories could be. They pointed me towards the records from the first Metro Chief of Police, Hubert Kemp. And so they allowed me to look through the records. I was working through those. Literally, instead of finding attendance reports and letters between differing heads of departments, uh, I ended up finding Kemp's personal file on the Paula Herring murder case. And what was in the file, uh, was brutal um, and not expected, uh, but there were things like uh, a letter from J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, uh, telegrams, letters from Mayor Briley at the time, some other folks, and I pretty quickly realized what's in the file doesn't seem to match the story that was in the newspapers at the time. So that got my attention in a big way. And then let's, as we set the table here, tell us about that murder. So that night, she was babysitting her younger brother. I guess kind of walk us through what happened that night. Certainly. So Paula Herring, uh, in February of 1964, was actually a student at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She had, in the prior spring, she had graduated from John Overton High School uh, out on Franklin Road here in Nashville. She was coming home for the weekend on a cold, what was that would be President's weekend, February 21st. She arrived on Friday. But on Saturday night, the 22nd, <clears throat> Paula's mother went out to dinner. Paula's mother was a nurse at Vanderbilt University Hospital. So the mom goes out to dinner, leaves Paula at home. The story was working on a book report and also babysitting her six-year-old little brother. When Paula's mom came back home around 11 p.m. was the story, what was discovered was Paula lying in the den, beaten badly, shot multiple times, and uh, the little boy, the six-year-old little brother, wandered out of his bedroom, and the story was that he had slept through this tragic ending to his sister. His sister being shot in a small home, <coughs> he slept through it. Exactly. And so you in the book say there were questions. <coughs> well, first of all, this was uh, immediately major news in Nashville. This, this was a huge deal. Uh, people were terrified. Absolutely. And they were terrified. That's a great point. And they were terrified in part because in New England, in Boston, the Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, was doing his work, if you want to call it work, uh, terrorizing New England. And in Nashville, 
there was a prowler, an, a prowler rapist doing most of his uh, deeds in the Creve Hall area, exactly where the Herrings lived. And it was a new subdivision. Uh, the people who lived in the Creve Hall area were convinced that the Metro Police, the services that they were supposed to be getting from the newly formed Metro, they were concerned that they were not able to protect them. And so on a night when literally everyone was on guard watching and being concerned about you know, the safety of their families, wives, there had been rapes uh, in the area just days prior to this, on a night when no one should have been able to get away with this, Paula Herring is murdered and the whole city was up in arms immediately. And I think what's so interesting about this to me is this book does take you back in time. <coughs> Nashville has changed so much. The Nashville of 1964, right after we had started Metro government, right. and the police department suddenly went from being responsible for a city area to a whole county area, right. and people were skeptical about that. And then we were, I guess, we were the typical small town. We had been written up as a, as a fairly corrupt town. Correct. It was a, it was, we were a different city. Uh, now we're the it city. Back then we were something different. And it's a, it's a great contrast. Um, so, in fact, I just saw the numbers the other day. I think uh, something like 13.9 million visitors have come to Nashville in 2016. And we continue to break records. But those visitors that are coming, more than a million a month, <clears throat> in 2016 they spent more than $6 billion covering 27,000 hotel rooms. So the contrast is back in the 50s and the 60s, People were coming to Nashville. A lot of them would come to the Grand Ole Opry at the Ryman Auditorium, uh, the church back then. But a lot of people were coming to Printer's Alley. And Printer's Alley was where you could get just any kind of vice satisfied or need. Illegal gambling, illegal drinking at the time, uh, sex, just anything you wanted. So the con, and it didn't take long, there were people like Jimmy Hoffa, uh, the Union Teamsters leader. Little Mickey Cohen, the uh, Los Angeles mobster, these fellows were coming in and out of Printer's Alley as well. So it didn't take long. By 1964, as you've suggested, uh, I think it was Life Magazine said Nashville's the most corrupt city in America. <laughs> far, far different than today. <clears throat> far different than today. And so, all right, we have to take a break. I want to I wanna take the break. And so where we're leaving it is you found this file and it focuses your attention on this case. You're yes. like, wow. And you said there were some questions I guess a couple of questions that you you wondered if they were asked properly. But we'll take a break, we'll come back, we'll talk about that. If you want to call, there's the number 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. Be back right after this.